John F. Kennedy was the youngest president to enter the White House. He was also the first Catholic. But what the world remembers about him is not so much his accomplishments as an atmosphere, a charisma, which accompanied his brief period of office. He was the first president in the television age, and nothing brought this home more vividly than the tragic circumstance of his death in November 1963 in Dallas, Texas. Kennedy's marriage to the beautiful Jacqueline Bouvier of Rhode Island was one of the social events of 1953. The freshman senator from Massachusetts went on to become a Pulitzer Prize winning author in 1957. He was the senior surviving son of an ambitious Boston Irish family. Second best is a loser was their slogan. Though he failed in 56 to win the vice presidential nomination, in 1960, Kennedy won the Democratic Party's nomination to run for president. In our devotion to this country, we wish to keep it strong, and we wish to keep it free. It requires, at this critical time, the best of all of us. And I can assure all of you here, who have reposed this confidence in me, that I will be worthy of your trust. We will carry the fight to the people in the fall, and we shall win. Though he won by the slenderest of margins, it was enough to satisfy the family ambitions of Ambassador Joe Kennedy, the new president's father. nation know, whether it wishes us well or ill, that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, to assure the survival and the success of liberty. John F. Kennedy seems almost to have invented the word charisma. He was young, charming, had a flashing smile, an easy wit, and a gift for inspiring the best instincts in other people. In that sense, Kennedy was a highly seductive man, and Washington in his time was a seductive place. I was a young reporter then, just starting out, but I recall vividly how we all felt that somehow we were at the center of the universe. In retrospect, of course, we were naive and even a trifle arrogant. But there was an unmistakable air of vitality in Washington in those years. And it was Kennedy who gave it that vitality. The strident language of Kennedy's inaugural address was soon to be tested in the realities of Cold War politics. First came the fiasco of the attempt to invade Cuba 
with guerrilla exiles trained in Guatemala. The Bay of Pigs was one of the most educative moments of Kennedy's early life in the presidency. As a result, his trust in the foreign policy establishment was badly shaken. Then came Kennedy's visit to Vienna, Austria to meet Nikita Khrushchev, the bellicose leader of Soviet Russia. Kennedy's relative inexperience was never more vividly portrayed than in his meeting with Khrushchev. Nikita Khrushchev was the man with the experience. He had a world vision, a grasp of the sometimes cynical realities of power politics. Kennedy had gone thinking that Khrushchev, like any other world leader, could be reasoned with. So I'm sure that he went there thinking that he could take this tough old curmudgeon and talk some sense into him. Well, he was wrong. And he came back dispirited and disillusioned and angry. And I think a wiser man. Kennedy had no sooner left Khrushchev then the Soviets put up a wall in Berlin to cut off their sector from the West. It was like a slap in the face to the young president, but there was little the Americans could do except make a show of force in their sector. Then in 1962 came the biggest test of all, a direct confrontation between the two nuclear superpowers. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere. And we hope around the world, God willing, that goal will be achieved. Personally, the Cuban Missile Crisis is the most vivid single recollection I have of the Kennedy administration. There was an air of great excitement combined with an almost visceral fear in Washington that night. And it was then that Kennedy announced what was variously described as a quarantine or a blockade. What we did not know that evening was the agony that he had gone through in the privacy of the Oval Office and in the company of a few select advisors. It was a massive test for a young president. And I think that he handled it brilliantly because to allow that kind of provocation to go unchallenged by a Soviet leader, Nikita Khrushchev, who doubted Kennedy's will anyway, would have been to invite a whole cycle of further provocation. For a week, the world held its breath to see if there would be nuclear war. But this time, American power prevailed. Khrushchev withdrew his missiles, and the world breathed again. Kennedy had no illusions about the responsibilities of power. Today, every inhabitant of this planet must contemplate the day when this planet may no longer be habitable. Every man, woman, and child lives under a nuclear sword of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation. 
or by madness. The weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. American presidents dispose of enormous power. Kennedy had to walk a terrifying path between preserving the security of the West and the possibility of a nuclear holocaust. These distant ships, these distant planes, these distant men keep the peace in a great half circle stretching all the way from Berlin to South Korea. For in an imperfect world where human folly has been the rule and not the exception, the surest way to bring on the war that can never happen is to sit back and assure ourselves it will not happen. Cold War politics allow a president no respite. World power means being ready for a crisis any day, anywhere. For Kennedy, there was also the problem of Southeast Asia. Uh, obviously, we will never know what Kennedy would have done in Vietnam. The early commitments in Southeast Asia were made largely by Dwight Eisenhower. But Kennedy did nothing to stop the gradual buildup at that time. There were some 15 or 16,000 so-called advisors in South Vietnam early in his administration. Furthermore, he, like his predecessors, worried that if one country in Southeast Asia went, uh, they would all go. There are those close to him who believe that he would have pulled America out that he would have turned the war over to the South Vietnamese. Others, however, believe that Kennedy would have found the requirements of national prestige, national power, national commitment, just as compelling as Nixon and Johnson found them after Kennedy had gone. My own view is that he would have had a lot of trouble extricating himself from a quagmire that was partly of his own making. It was in these years, too, that reactionary states in the Deep South clashed head-on with presidential power. The race issue in America constituted Jack Kennedy's major domestic crisis. And the way he handled it tells a lot about him. Kennedy did more than simply federalize the Alabama National Guard, although that was an extraordinarily important gesture. For the first time, Kennedy asked Congress to pass a civil rights bill that would give the federal government punitive powers. Powers could be exercised to punish state governments that refused to give blacks equal open access to public accommodations. It was a historic turning point. We have a right to expect that the Negro community will be responsible, will uphold the law, but they have a right to expect that the law will be fair that the Constitution will be colorblind, as Justice Harlan said at the turn of the century. This is what we're talking about, and this is a matter which concerns this country and what it stands for. The men who create power make an indispensable contribution to the nation's greatness. But the men who question power make a contribution just as indispensable especially when that questioning is disinterested. For they determine whether we use power or power uses us. Our national strength matters, but the spirit which informs and controls our strength matters just as much. Brief though they were, the Kennedy years established a new political style. Here, too, was power. The problem we will always have in evaluating Kennedy accurately is the problem of separating image from substance. The whole creation of the Camelot legend tends, first of all, to exaggerate what it was. It wasn't Camelot. It was the day-to-day -day dirty business of government that he was involved in. But it also tends to do him a disservice. He had no illusions that this was King Arthur's court. He was a very canny politician. Kennedy's style was a useful adjunct to American power in the world. Wherever he went, 
The president carried with him the shrewdness and charm of the Boston Irish. The people were thrilled, even if their leaders were more skeptical. Kennedy did not invent the idea of the image-making overseas tour de force, but he, he certainly improved on the idea. And he took a road show that had already captivated his domestic audience to a world that was eager to see what this young figure was made of. So therefore, it was not surprising that millions of perfectly ordinary Berliners showed up and gave him a thundering outpouring of not just devotion, but sheer, almost frightening adulation. All free men, wherever they may live, are citizens of Berlin. And therefore, as a free man, I take pride in the word, Ich bin ein Berliner. Though they were words only, Berliners saw Kennedy as the defender of their freedom. The wall was still there, a reminder of the constant competition which existed between the superpowers. It was a competition which was expressed most dramatically in space. I do not regard the first man in space as a sign of the weakening of the free world, but I do regard the total mobilization of men and uh, things for the service of the communist bloc over the last years as a source of great danger to us. And I would say we're going to have to live with that danger and hazard uh, through much of the rest of this century. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. The space program and Kennedy were a perfect match for each other. I mean, it symbolized the kind of competitive vigor that he wanted to bring. And what better symbol than the joining of government and industry private capital, public resources in a spectacular theatrical display of American enterprise and competitive vigor. America's space feats would be performed on the television screens of the world. Kennedy exploited television more than any other person before him. He knew that through the medium of television you can talk over the heads of Congress and the writing press directly to the voters. He used it at his news conferences, which were routinely televised, and he discovered that the reporters who attended the news conferences could themselves become minor bit players in the media drama that he was orchestrating. Underlying Kennedy's power was an ability to make anything serve his image, like inviting the Black Watch to visit the White House. While Kennedy was a serious-minded politician with the burning ambition to be president of the United States, he was not above using all the tricks of the trade to promote his cause. And, uh, he never prevented photographers from taking pictures of him on a sailboat. He knew that he himself projected an image of charm. He also knew he had a highly attractive and photogenic family. I think he sensed instinctively that Americans have an affection for what passes for aristocracy. And the Kennedys came as close as anybody else. It is extraordinarily difficult 
to estimate John F. Kennedy's impact on history. His tenure was too brief, his life too quick. There were some ingredients in his presidency, his civil rights posture, for example, that indicated that he had great imagination and considerable courage. But on balance, his domestic policy was highly conventional. And in foreign policy, he deviated little from the mainstream of Cold War thinking. He, like others before him and others after him, was preoccupied with America's image and America's strength. But the tragedy of John Kennedy in the end is that his talents were never fully tested and therefore never fully revealed. I look forward to a great future for America, a future in which our country will match its military strength with our moral restraint, its wealth with our wisdom, its power with our purpose. I look forward to an America which will not be afraid of grace and beauty, which will protect the beauty of our natural environment and which will build handsome and balanced cities for our future. I look forward to an America which will reward achievement in the art as we reward achievement in business or statecraft. I look forward to an America which will steadily raise the standards of artistic accomplishment and which will steadily enlarge cultural opportunities for all of our citizens. And I look forward to an America which commands respect throughout the world, not only for its strength, but for its civilization as well. And I look forward to a world which will be safe, not only for democracy and diversity, but also for personal distinction. <laughs>